The Sydney Opera House, a landmark known from all corners of the globe. But how iconic could it have been if it looked like this? And what about the famous landmark next door, the Sydney Harbour Bridge? How spectacular would this bridge stay if it looks like this? I got this, well I found this on the Time Out uh, Sydney website, uh, but I think I've seen this on other articles as well as I was um, just browsing it before as well. But as you can see, seven Sydney Opera House designs that never saw the light of day. And as you can see, this one, very good remake, um, obviously redesign on, you know, building it to what these uh, designs would have been in a 3D aspect. So. Yeah, uh, written by Alana Ma. With its iconic design that looks like a carefully balanced assemblage of white sails or to some racked of stacked dishes. Oh, because of the... I, I know what you mean. Uh, it's there, as you can see. Uh, on Benelong Point, the Sydney Opera House, Australia's most famous landmark and a UNESCO World Heritage listed site. is an indisputed masterpiece of human creativity. More than 200 designs were submitted when the state premier Joseph Cahill announced an international competition to build a national opera house at Benelong Point. In February of 1956, and the story behind the design we know today is filled with so much drama, uh, yep, it could rival any opera you'd see on various stages. That's probably the saddest thing about um, this whole thing with the opera house, Wilson never returned the most famous landmarks in the world and he never returned to Australia and Sydney to see it for himself. Yeah, very, um, very sad. But relatively unknown 38 year old Danish architect Utsun won the competition with his sculptural design, one of 12 submissions considered, which would go on to transform not only his career but also the image of the nation. Sadly, Joseph Cahill would never see his dream realized the premier died before construction was completed. Oh, okay. Well, that's something I actually never knew. Um, that's actually some interesting history there. Because I always, like I said before, I always knew uh, Utsun never returned um, to see the Opera House completed and he never did um, rest in peace. Uh, yeah, even um, never see his dream realized the premier died before construction. Yeah, I didn't know that, so that's uh, interesting. Uh, to know so yeah that's a good lesson history lesson there as well even Utsun himself would never see his masterpiece realized yep after a stash with the Minister for Works over spiraling costs Utsun resigned and left the country never to return but what would the city be like if it wasn't for the 222 competition entries was picked cultural institution taking pride of place at Circular Quay could have entirely been a different vibe UK based creative studio Neomarm unearthed seven of the best entries and created these incredible digital renderings as commissioned by Budget Direct Travel Insurance to give us a glimpse on how Sydney could have looked different. It is interesting to note that no limit was set on the budget available to build a winning entry. The winning contest allowed architects to enter any number of drawings as long as they were black and white. It was also pointed out that architects would need to allow space for at least 100 cars to park on site, mostly for those orchestra. Yeah, okay. So this one, I like this one, which is this, but obviously compared to what we got, like, the, the thing is, I like the design of it, but it's too small. Like, this could have been a much bigger, could have been wider, and it could have been bigger. Like, you compare the opera house we have today, and like, the sheer size of it, uh, yeah. Like, it's not obviously probably going to be the exact way it would have looked in the drawing, but, um, yeah, but I like this part of it. Uh, it kind of feels like um, a little part of the Opera House we already have, uh, as if you see here I put in. Alright, so the first one, the Philadelphia Collaborative's group design. This brutalist design was a runner-up in the competition. Imagine getting runner-up this to what we have. Inspired by Natalia Shell, it consists of ascending spirals formed with height windows topped with roof made from folded concrete covered in copper. The group behind the design, described as a pickup band, was formed by seven men, mostly Americans in the architecture trade and visiting critic from France. 
The design group Geddes, Breacher, Quells, Cunningham was a result of the group working on the Sydney Opera House. The firm would later earn the profession's highest honour. I like the um, sculpture of the part of the mill, but obviously, I, I don't know. It just looks too small to what it would have looked if that's how it was going to pop up. Uh, so this second one here, right? This one just, uh, just it's too old. Um, just looks too boring. Like it's like a pretty much a block of you know building, but it's it's just obviously not as good. Paul Boisevin and Barbara Osman's design. This boxy concept from the Dutch-British husband and wife architectural duo would rather looks rather conservative next to the pearly pearly shells from Woodson and the Philly collaborative, which might have been bumped it down to third place. However, the judges were impressed with the human scale of the two buildings. Yeah, because the scale is bigger than this one, much bigger. So it would have been good if this scale was like this. Yeah. The design with its emphasis on walking is reminiscent to the tiled ground or to rooftop walkway of the Oslo Opera House in Norway, which was built 50 years later after Bossy V and, and Osman's own realistic vision. Okay, so this was similarly built in Norway later, in Oslo, yeah. You gotta remember, like, these were designed in the 50s to 60s. Um, I think construction started, yeah, in the 60s. Um, completed in 73, will open in 73 by uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Obviously it stands out today, like I think that the Opera House that we have today is just gonna remain ageless, but you gotta think like today, how would this would have looked? Uh, I don't think it would have aged really well. Um, yeah. Oh gee. Was this some Roman or something? Jesus. Uh, so Eugene Goosen's design. Okay, so this Art Deco design was never entered in the company. Oh, okay. But the bloke who dreamed it up would have had some considerable sway to get it across the line. It's the work of English composer Sir Eugene Goosen, a key advocate for a new opera house. Moved to Sydney in 1947 to take up position of conductor to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Oh, okay. New South Wales state of music after two decades of conducting orchestras in big fancy purpose built buildings. He arrived to find our local orchestra performing in comparatively inadequate 1889 Sydney Town Hall, so he knocked up this design with a outdoor music bowl out the front. I don't even know what that looks like. That This, um, what is it, an outdoor music bowl? Like, like that would have been good if it was like this size, not this small size, but oh, that looks very interesting. I like this one. This one looks really good. Um, yeah, I don't like the colors for it, but if they change this to like a silver white uh, to the Opera House we have today, I like this one. So, Laszlo, Peter Collar, and Balthasar Korab design. This bold design cracked fourth place in the competition, I would put it higher, I reckon, and was the highest ranked Australian entry. Oh, so Australian designs. Okay, this judges commented on the project's very skillful planning. Both Colin and Korab were also refugees. Having independently fled in the communist regime of Hungary, Kola was an architect and professor who lectured at the UNSW until his death in 2000, was prominent in architectural photography, and was based in Detroit for most of his career. His work is said to have captured the moodiness and romanticism of even the most austere buildings. Kola was actually a big fan of Utzon's vision. Oh, good and became the chairman of the Yutzen in Charge Committee. Oh, okay, well that's um, that's actually really good. Still came involved to what the Opera House was uh, today. During the 60s, committee campaigned on Yutzen's behalf, his disputes with the New South Wales government. The sheer size, like this size is obviously good as well. I like the size of this one, here, looking here. Um, this looks similar to the other one. Yeah, the, it's, Again, this wouldn't have aged, like, if you're looking at the Opera House, if this is what we got today, it would have been knocked down, redone. 100%. Like, buildings today in Sydney are getting knocked down and redeveloped because obviously they're just, you know, they just don't look modern anymore. And yeah, this would have definitely been around the same thing, like, this Opera House, if it went through back then, would have 
been redeveloped now, 100%. But obviously not. This submission was not dissimilar to the yeah, box shape with a promenade idea, but this English duo tucked their promenade under a raised building and put a helicopter pad on the roof. Oh. 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 That's ugly. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about your design, but... Uh, no. Uh, presuming in case the conductor needed to get somewhere in a hurry. The conductor need to get somewhere in a hurry? Okay. <laughs> Where's he going? Both Dale and Milburn appreciated the Milburn Stanley's father's architectural firm in Sunderland. Firm split in 47 was thought that this was Stanley wished to seek larger commissions for the competition. He was unsuccessful in winning other competitions, especially won the Welsh Medical School of Cardiff. Job was incomplete at his death in 61. Okay. Um, I don't mind this one. At least this one has like a nice looking feel to it. I'm not sure about this, but everything around it looks pretty good. Like these window looking, looks like the windows looking out. Yeah. The Vine and Vine, the English company's sprawling opera house, was made up of two individuals' auditoriums separated by a foyer restaurant area with a sunken plaza by the waterside and a vivid red facade. This looks, this sounds like what we get today. So we've got a restaurant area, which we do, with a sunken plaza on the waterside. Well, on the, well not on this side, but on the other side, that's kind of like that. Uh, so we'll just have to imagine how Breathless would get that strange spiraling stairwell off to one side. Yeah, that's it. I don't like that at all. Um, hmm. This one's nice. I like this one. This one, like I was saying before, with, you know, looking modern and, uh, you know, remaining ageless. This one, I reckon this one would have stayed. This one looks really nice. This one would have kept its age, I reckon. Uh, Kelly and Grusen's design. While the sunken courtyards echo a Vines team design, there's a certain Vegas, Vegas-esque to this American group sentence entry. This design features a heck of a lot of concrete and glass. Yeah, which is a lot of buildings today which are made like the big glass windows, you can say. Which seems to be a bit of a signature for the firm, which became known for many types of architecture across the states, both public and private. With a focus of educational structures, the pair also designed what could well be New York's answer to Sydney's serious building. The pair also designed what could well be New York's answer to Sydney's serious building. Oh right, yeah, that's not a nice looking building over at the rocks. Chatham Towers. Oh, I see, so it looks a bit similar, hey. Right, okay. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Oh, okay, and the bridge was up next. Yeah, so I was going to check out the bridge ones as well, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but... Yeah, I, um... Looking back, I like this design. I do like this one. It's, um... This would have stayed, I reckon, in place, but obviously it's too small looking. This one, boring. This one's just crazy looking. This one's nice. I like this one, but it had a different color. Um, this one's similar in a helicopter that just looks plain ugly. Not too bad. And I think this might be the best one, actually. This is at number seven. Yeah, so anyway, that's what the Sydney Opera House would have looked like. I've got to say, yeah, I'm happy with what we have now. So moving on to six alternative designs for the Sydney Harbour Bridge that were never built. Now, looking at this one straight away, i got to say, this looks amazing, this one. And I will get to it in a sec, but um, it is a bit different because obviously the bridge we have today goes across here and this one goes across this way. But what looks amazing is you got a south to north and then a, a west. And that would have worked out really well. Written by Alana Meyer again, the heritage listed Sydney Harbour Bridge is iconic to the Emerald City. I like how you've written that. As the shell like white sails of the Sydney Opera House, but you may not know the design for the coat hanger, as we affectionately call it, which is the largest steel arch bridge in the world, was not decided upon until very easily. Upon very easily. 
I like to think that the the Sydney Harbour Bridge is an icon of Sydney and Australia and the Sydney Opera House is an icon of the world. The decision process took nearly a quarter of a century. The bridge we know today was opened 89 years ago in 1932. The construction started in 1923 but it could have been a very different story. Let's, ex let's explore some of the visions just how differently Circular Quay would have looked like if the government had swayed by other proposed designs. Incredible digital renderings were created by UK-based creative studio Neomam. So the same again there. Uh, already that looks... Anyway, Norman Self's design. British-born architect became very close to being known as the man who designed the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And it kind of sounds like old mate was actually done dirty. He submitted various designs for various competitions coming second in 1900. In 1902, he won a second competition, however, the bridge was never built due to an economic slowdown, which meant that he couldn't claim his prize of £20,000. That's pounds, right? Not euros. For further work he did on the designs, he submitted further plans in 1908, but city planners at the time favoured a tunnel instead. A tunnel instead, eh? Well, we didn't get that till the 80s. 90s. It was like 90s that they no the late 80s they just finally decided to build a harbor tunnel so that's a long time later uh his design not used was what well, he was successful were regarded enough to have an area of the city normanhurst oh so he's uh renamed after normanhurst okay well that well, that's nice that's good for him after him during his lifetime we wonder how New Z fireworks displays would be spread over the three missions still we know today. Yeah, it's a bit... You gotta remember as well, these were designs, yeah, in the 1900s. So, you look at the bridge we have today, stands out as an icon, and it will stay that forever. But yeah, this bridge just wouldn't have stand out today. No way. Right next to this Sydney Opera House? No. Absolutely not. I like to think as well, because the bridge is a massive icon and it's, you know, symbolic, it would be interesting to see if the Opera House we got today would have actually been the Opera House, you know, we had, because obviously, who knows? Who knows? Imagine we had this one with the other Opera House designs. Dorman, Long and Co's other design. I don't mind this one. This one seems familiar as a, I guess, a bridge bridges we've seen around the world. Uh, looks similar to the bridge in uh, Brisbane actually. Uh, a bridge looking in Brisbane. So before Domo and Longo eventually won the 1924 design competition, they actually submitted seven different tenders. So she and the architects eventually won the 1924 design competition. So they, oh so this was enough. Oh so they designed the, did they? I thought it was someone else. Hang on a second. I'll look that out there. One of them was this cantilever bridge design was the center span of 487 meters. Plans failed to meet the requirement the quiet specifications because they used precast concrete blocks rather than granite. Okay. I don't mind this one. This one would have standed out um, yeah, quite nicely, but yeah. Well, here it is here. Francis Ernst Stowe's design. Yeah, this looks incredible. Look, looking at it, it's okay. This is a radical concept. Might be our favorite bridges that never was. Yeah, and apparently it was narrowly rejected. Francis Ernest Stowe was an architecture and engineer who practiced at Parramatta, and submitted this multi-pronged design in 1922 competition. The design links Balls Head, Millers Point, and Balmain meeting in the middle with a central tower on Goat Island. Oh, so that's Goat Island, right? So it would have been over there. Man, that would have been very impressive though. I think it would have been a bit out of the way because it goes this way instead of that way. So it might have, but still the look of it just looks incredible. Central Tower was 152 meters high and was designed to double a war memorial. Wow, go to Ireland and rename it Anzac Isle. Wow, that would have been... So we got Anzac Bridge and stuff on called Anzac, but Anzac Isle with a war memorial as a bridge? That would have been very historic. This would have standed out really well today, I reckon. 
In his day, Stowe designed several messianic buildings across NSW as well as the tramway systems and a coal handling plant. He also designed several engineering devices. Yeah, that, um, it's definitely a bridge we definitely missed out on, but the bridge we have today is still the best. But, uh, well, I'm glad we did not get this one. My goodness. P. Henderson's design. Long time before the government opened the design competition, a bridge across the harbour was actually first proposed in 1815 when an architect and convict named Francis Greenway suggested it to the government. One of the earliest known plans drawn up was his proposed proposal by engineer Peter Henderson. So all the way back in 1815, they were planning to design a bridge, but it never happened until 1932 when it officially opened. So over a century later, like, Things are slow here. Yeah, so before that, there was no bridge or anything. It was pretty much just a boat taking things back and forth, which, yeah, a bit crazy that. Features a proposal a high column of masonry on the, uh, the on each side of a terrace-like bridge of iron. The proposal was to be accepted. Arrangements were made for the free passage of large ships. I'm glad we, this would have been knocked down and redeveloped by a, least 2000 gee yeah that would have not aged well okay this looks similar but uh, i don't mind this one either uh david b Stoneman, holton robinson's design so the design both combines principles of both cantilever and suspension bridges was created by two american architects and engineers the pair developed the design for tender put in english electric company in australia 1924 between them the two design bridges in, in countries all over the world including the usa all these countries there, the design was said to be a suspension bridge. Bridge of novel design more rigid than existing suspension bridges at the time, but official reports say that the bridge would not have been a pleasing outline. Been a pleasing outline. I don't mind this one. It's better than this one and hmm, this one. It's better than those. And this one, again, a bit McLean Marshall Products Company Design. The American steel manufacturing company behind the design of the famous Golden Gate Bridge and George Washington Bridge in New Jersey. The same company behind those designs? And this is the one you suggest here? What? San Francisco Bridge. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, iconic. Same, George Washington is, hang on, I think, because I think this one's pretty good too. I think we might have driven over it when I was in New York. Yeah, look at that. That's, that's pretty, that's really good looking too. And this is the, the design they come up here? Gee. You sure? Come on. Anyway. New Jersey put a number of tenders to the Sinai Bridge in the 1924 competition. This rather practical one was designed for the purpose of taking every advantage of the clearance allowed for shipping. The review tender summarized this one as an improvement on the proposal in Tender B, but it cannot be said altogether harmonized with its surroundings. We're inclined to agree this one has nothing on the gentle slopes of our coat hanger. No, it doesn't. This looks... I think the other two I said before were better than this one, and these this company designed the Golden Gate and George Washington Bridge. Come on, nah, nah, and that's it. Yeah, so this is this one's obviously the one that would have been very fascinating, and I'm surprised this bridge doesn't exist anywhere in Australia anyway. Um, this would have been a very fascinating design. Yeah, that's how Sydney could have looked. And I gotta say I'm very happy with how it looks today. Although that there looks very impressive, but you know, that would be in an alternate universe. That's it. What do you think of these? Did you like any of those or is there any similar ones there? Um actually, one last thing. One last thing. John Redfield. Is an Australian engineer known as prominent society? Oh, he was the engineer, not the designer. Right. Father of the Mon Sydney Bradfield. No really roles in the construction of the Sydney Bridge. In the construction of the bridge. Makes sense. Well, constructed it magnificently. Oh yeah, here's the other bridge while it's here, the Story Bridge. So that is the one in Brisbane that looks very similar to the one you saw before. 
So obviously this stands out and I think that's like a nice standout for Brisbane, but yeah, that's it. Anyway, thank you all today and thank you all. And uh, until next time, I will see you soon.